A scrapbook of sound. An elite ninja. That's the way it was, and that's the way it is. Bring in more ninja feet and kids. The big sick machine job. Press two boys. Ninja. Number one in the world of sound. I'm a ninja. There is a guy in the South Village called Tony. He is a ninja. He's a ninja. An iPod Ninja is like an iPod Nano, except it's a million times thinner. Let us see what our first ninja can do. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ninja Tune Podcast. My name's Dexter and uh, once again I'll be your host for this episode. I'm going to be joined by Bonobo, who's going to be coming in for a chat about his new album Black Sands, which is coming out via Ninja Tune on the 29th of March. And then after that I'm going to run through some of the best new releases we've got coming up through Ninja Tune, Big Dada and the whole family of labels. From artists including Amika, Infesticons, Jamma, Andrea Triana, Grasscut, Daedalus. Please stay tuned. I'm joined by Simon Green, also known as Bonobo. You're here to talk about the new album. It's called Black Sands. Obviously, it's been a few years since your last one. Has there been a big musical journey or any sort of big epiphany and change leading you towards any kind of new sound? Yeah, there has, because it's been such a long time that the, the record's changed. Because when I started out this record, I was still very much in a kind of, um, in a kind of live mode. Like I'd finished the last record being really into it. Um, getting into more of a live sound and then about I was probably about a year ago I just completely fell back in love with making beats again and the whole electronics thing and programming and, and uh, yeah just good old fashioned beat making which I hadn't done for a while I've sort of fallen out of favour with it a little bit but a few things have just started getting me excited again about it especially um Moving from Brighton up to London was kind of a big thing as well. So doing that and uh, just kind of getting into a lot of stuff that was going on around. I just think that the, the genre at the time was a bit stale. And um, it seems like in the last year or so, there's been some really interesting music coming out of um, coming out of the whole sort of instrumental beats corner, um, which I hadn't been into for a while. I was even sort of kind of almost dismissed it completely and was just going to go fully live but um, yeah so that's the main thing so if you listen to the record you'll see that there's I mean the older tracks sound like the live tunes stuff like Animals or um, or Black Sands um, but then the newer stuff like Eyes Down and Chiara was kind of came out of this sort of new love of beat making again so there's still quite a, there's quite a variety on the record and I think you can hear that as the, as the record moves and I think it almost benefits from having like two years of, of um, you know developing taste and progression that's gone into it The next question I wanted to ask was about the title, were you on holiday in Tenerife or Lanzarote or something or is there some deeper meaning to it? I don't know, it can be interpreted in different ways, I wanted to, I wanted to sort of, to, wanted it to kind of sound slightly um, you know, just just to be ambiguous as to what it was, but um, I think it's just one of those titles that sort of works with the imagery. I think Black Sands is kind of it can be interpreted in a few different ways. And also the uh, the artwork itself is quite uh, is quite mysterious. Where did the idea for that come from, and uh, where was that picture taken? I've always had this idea about um, very bleak, remote landscape, but with you know with some sort of man-made structure somewhere very remote, where there's obviously been people sort of out in these very remote locations there's something quite kind of mysterious about um, so we kind of trawled around a few locations and we found this place in the lake district uh, we found this transistor mast and the idea is that there's three main images and they're all taken from in a triangle all facing each other and there's a thing on google maps as well where you can see the triangle it's been mapped out on google maps you can click on each point and it'll show you the, the, the record sleeve
your music always uh, strikes me as being quite kind of technologically advanced. Is that something you consciously do? Do you try and keep one step ahead of the curve? Um, I don't try and keep ahead of it so much. Not so much in technology, but I think just in in um, just in the sound, just in the palette of what I'm doing. And you know, I think this record especially is probably the most sort of contemporary of of any of my stuff. But it's not necessarily driven by technology. It's just trying to sort of um, get a sound that, that I'm into at the time and that can be done on... I mean, my, my actual studio isn't that kind of... You know, nothing's been updated since about 2005 in my studio, so it's still kind of... It's not, you know... I don't think music is so much driven by... You know, sort of contemporary sound isn't so much driven by technology, it's more by um, just a kind of feel for, for, for getting, a, getting a sound right and getting... Um, you know, getting uh, getting a noise that, that, that sounds like it belongs in the, in the time that it was made, which can be done on any equipment. You know, it, just, it can be done on sort of very old old school gear as well. But it's just um, I just want to try and make music that sounds like it couldn't have been made any other time other than now. Listening through this album, I noticed that you've, you're working quite a lot with a specific vocalist in Andreas Rihanna. Um, how was it that you ended up coming to produce her and also to have her on your record like this? Because of the uh, the Worldwide Awards, I collected the award for days to come, and um, they asked me to do and uh, put together an acoustic set. And it was very short notice, so I had to cobble together this little ensemble to go and do this awards. And uh, my keys player Sai, yeah, so we we. Um, just got together at my house that afternoon before heading up to Cargo, which is the first time I've met her. Um, and we just did this tune and we all got up on stage and everyone got drunk and forgot what they were doing. Uh, but we kind of struggled through it. Yeah, and after that, we were just uh, there was just a, there was sort of some sort of connection musically in terms of we were just into the same stuff and had the same ideas and appreciated the same music. So it wasn't a while until she started touring with us a bit later on that year. She was kind of like depping for our regular vocalist, and then we we kind of spent a bit of time on the road together. And after that, we just sort of naturally started making tunes together. I knew she was getting her record together. She'd already started it with. with um, a couple of other people but wasn't quite feeling the vibe on it. So yeah, we got together and tried a couple of things out and then, you know, like within two days we had like three tracks done with hers. From then on we're like, yeah, let's just do this record and yeah, we just like knocked out a track every week for the best part of like, you know, the best part of a year. As that was happening, I was making my own record, so I was obviously playing her stuff along the way, and then she would like occasionally jump in with an idea on some of my stuff. So that's how it that's how it came about. Certainly, how the keeper came about. It was like it was just an instrumental tune. It was just like a little riff and a beat, and um, wasn't quite sure which way to take it. And then Andrea was like, "Oh, I've got this little idea. I might just put this put this hook down." And that was that. I know she said that I don't need her. Every time I call, she sits and sleeps her. But when I know she said to get near her, but I'm feeling cold and I must leave her. We've had a kind of a brief talk about the album. I wanted to talk a bit more about what's behind it, and your career as a musician, and where you started out. Um, I was reading over some stuff that, that said you sort of you moved to Brighton and that was a bit of a spark for you. Was that move inspired by an aspiration to become a musician full time? Was that the, was that something you'd always wanted to do? I moved to Brighton just because it felt like a, a good thing. You know, I was in a, a, a fairly small town in in, uh, in Hampshire. And I think when you get to like seventeen, there's like you know you, you kind of hit the ceiling there. So um, 
I, I knew a few people who were just sort of working down in Brighton for the summer. I just went down there and fell in love with the place and stayed. But I think getting to Brighton helps in terms of the, the time I was there, which was sort of late 90s. It was a really exciting time for Brighton. The whole sort of big beat thing was going on. And yeah, and then sort of surrounded by like minded people and then getting out of sort of bands in people's garages, getting into sort of meeting people who were doing stuff with samplers and you know, and, and sort of just thinking about thinking about music in a different way than I considered. It was really exciting. Um, I had like a little Atari and a, and a little Akai sampler. And whilst I was at college, I was just um, digging around, like throwing samples in there, and just like really getting like headfirst into the into this whole sort of new world of of making music on your own with with beats and programming and you know using samplers and uh, and incorporating that into what I'd been doing before, which was mainly just sort of guitar based stuff plus you know everything that's going on around the whole club thing in Brighton and starting to DJ and that kind of stuff so it was a really exciting time and I think that's pretty, basically where the first record came from it was from that time in Brighton um, you know and I'd had people around me that were doing music and it, were, it was a time when like everybody in Brighton had a record label everybody had a record shop everyone was a DJ it was a sort of much healthier time for, for independent music there. it was a lot easier to do so I knew people who, you know, were putting out little twelves and sevens and had all this stuff and they were always like a little bit older than me, so my stuff was never really taken that seriously. So I was just kind of messing around with it thinking like, you know, one day I'll get a record out and then by the time I'd played Rob Louie the first tune, which is Terrapin, I kind of pretty much had all of Animal Magic there which I'd never really considered it was something that anyone would want to listen to. I mean, I just played a couple of tunes to Rob and he's like, well, have you got any more? And I played him the rest and he's like, OK, that's, that's an album, let's put that out. So at that point, you'd gone from, you know, working in your bedroom, collecting all your own samples, and then before you know it, you've got an album, you've sold 10,000 copies and you're signed to Ninja Tune Records. Was there a conscious, like, opening of doors in your mind then? Did you deliberately make a step? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, it was, it was hard to... To know what to do after that, because I think obviously the first record, you know, is that old cliche that you've got your whole life to make your first record and a year to make your second. And I think that was kind of true of, uh, when I signed to Ninja. It was like, right, it's on now. I'm, this is what I'm doing. I've got this, this deal, and um, I need to make this record. So it was, um, yeah, it was a really tough record to make the second one. Um, I think it's just one of those things you can never really, what well, I can't anyway, I can never sort of sit down with a concept and go, right, I'm going to make this record and it's going to be about this and it's going to sound like this. It's, it's always been just sit down, make some noises, dig around, see what happens, see what sounds nice and then just and just kind of get on with it. Um, so yeah, the second record was, was very much about that still. It's always been the way I worked. Um, even though I realise it, sort of now it's Ninja Tune and it's, you know, people kind of know who I am now. Before they didn't, you know, it was an unknown quantity. So it's always a bit more of a pressure to, to sort of follow up on something than, than be, you know, sort of come from obscurity. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I didn't want to sort of try and make this big ambitious record. So I thought I'd just keep on doing the same, you know, working with the same formulas in, in terms of in terms of just I'm gonna just keep kind of keep making tunes on a sampler and. and and see what happens. That's what I did, and I think sort of the second one, especially, was is out, it's probably like the, the most sample based out of out of um, all of the all of the stuff. I mean, the first Animal Magic had lots of live bits on it, but um, yeah, Die Length for Monkey was just straight up samples and beats, um, completely instrumental. I sort of used vocal samples in the first one. There's not a sort of a not a drop of of, of human voice on the second record. It's all just just kind of um, straight up samples and, and, and drum programming. I think there's some really nice moments on that record, definitely. So having made a record like that that was so sampled then, was there ever a conscious choice to move it towards live and to put something together that you'd be able to perform? Yeah, because it was, you know, after that record it was like, OK, I've been DJing, but I don't think I'm really representing my records when I'm doing it. When I was DJing, I was always playing more of a dance floor thing a lot heavier just kind of playing in clubs and I think there was a point where people were sort of coming to the gigs wanting to hear my tunes and wanting to hear my stuff but there's only a sort of small percentage of my own music that I can get away with playing when I'm DJing some people just want me to stand there and plus play on my record so rather than sort of compromising the DJing um, 
you know, the other option was just sort of stand there behind a the laptop and like nod into it and, and play some tunes, which didn't represent how the record was made because I was obviously like throwing all kinds of aspects in there. And I always knew that with the right combination of musicians, it could be done live. So I wanted to, it was kind of all or nothing with the live band. So has that live thing uh, ever ended up taking precedence? Once you've started doing that, is that now the essence of the band? Or is it still very much more about the studio and making albums? Yeah, I mean, the, you know, people always think that because I've started this live band, I'm now sort of writing for the band, which isn't true. Um, I'm still still writing the same way. I'm, st- You know, it's not like an afterthought that, that how we're going to do this live, but I, it doesn't inform the way I work. I don't think, like, oh, I'm not going to do this because we won't be able to play it live, or I am going to do this because it will sound good live. I just do the best I can independently of whether it's, it's going to work on stage or not, make the best tunes, and then, and then think about it afterwards, like, how are we going to deconstruct it and perform it live? Yeah, I'd certainly say that that's something I recognise listening to Black Sands. It's, um, it seems like a really emotional record, you know, it's, uh, there's almost this uh, bit of melancholia in there. Would you describe yourself as melancholy, do you think? Yeah, I think there always has been an aspect of that. Um, I don't know whether it's just a process, maybe because, because, because it's a kind of solo thing and I usually work kind of at night. It takes a couple of hours to really get into it, like in the studio for sort of making stuff. And I think some people use music for different reasons, and I always just kind of use it as a as a way of kind of you know shutting down and just like getting into something else. And I think some people appreciate music in different ways, and for me, it's always been a sort of emotional attachment or an emotional sort of engagement rather with music. That's always what made it. Like a favourite song has always been a favourite song because there's been some kind of emotional attachment. There are tunes which are just like straight up heavy and you know you can just kind of get you moving. But um but yeah I'm more sort of I like to sort of engage with music in that way. So um, that's probably how I end up sort of making making tunes like that. But yeah I mean I guess for for, for a large part it is so you know I try and uh, I get some sort of emotional reaction from it anyway. As you have just been saying, talking about the way that you like to engage with music, it seems like a logical time to move on to some of your choices, the tracks that you picked as key influences and favourites for us. Mark Moulin's uh, Aria was the first one that you sent over, which um, certainly has that similar feel. It's obviously kind of a, a downbeat instrumental music, but with a real emotional kick to it as well. And can you tell us a little bit about why you've picked that? Yeah, I mean, Mark Moulin, this was actually a band uh, called Placebo from the 60s, not the 90s Placebo. Um, yeah, this record, I think there was just a time where this band, like, for about two years, they made this one record which just, like, properly hit it. Sounds really, sounds really up to date, actually. Sounds like it could have been made yesterday. And just the production of it, the way that it's sort of led by the drums and the horns, and it's just got that sort of, um, you know, all those ninths and minors. It's just really... Um, it's just, yeah, it's just got an amazing swing to it. I mean, there's another, I mean, that was one track. It could have been another tune called Balek. It's just really sort of progressive. Don't know where to place it, that's the other thing, because it seems like it's it's lots of different contexts all at once. It's kind of not really jazz, it's not really soul, it's not really kind of rock. It's just like all over the place. Um, and the next choice that you've got is a Curtis Mayfield track, and it's kind of obviously completely the other side of the coin to Mark Moolah. Um and it's a song called "Ride On Through uh, Ride On for the Darkness." Um, yeah, what what is it about that one? I think it's just sort of it just does everything. You know, it starts from this this one little guy playing a guitar, a really nice little tune, and just the, the the way the you know the way the guitar sounds, the way his voice sounds, and then all of a sudden it's like thirty seconds in, there's like bang there's a whole you know it's like someone switches on a light and the room's actually full of like you know a hundred strong orchestra um i just love it I just, it's a journey as well this tune i mean it's probably like a, you know a fairly obvious choice for, for you know it's not exactly the most obscure record but i think that's something great about sort of you know something that needs to be appreciated about sort of really well produced pop music and i think this is this is one of them um I mean, it's a, it's a great tune. I just like the way it, it builds and drops and then it ends in this thing. It's not sort of... doesn't conform to any sort of traditional structure either. I mean, the fact that it's like almost seven minutes long and it ends in this kind of... 
ends in this sort of um, orchestral sort of stroke at the end is um, yeah, it's a clever tune. I like it. Through the Darkness by Curtis Mayfield, picked by Bonobo, of course. Um, your next choice is um, by Meat Beat Manifesto. Well, this is probably the tune that, that switched me on to electronic music. From being like a 14-year-old listening to sort of American, you know, American hardcore and and uh, sort of European shoegaze stuff, to then hearing, you know, going out when I was probably too young to be going out to these things. But... Um, yeah, hearing that tune, there was something really menacing about it because I think maybe it was the context that I heard it in when I was kind of young and and going out to sort of parties where I possibly shouldn't have been. Um, and, it, you know, around that whole time when, when you know, the sort of acid house thing had been around for a little while but it was still a little bit murky. It was before it kind of... anything had been sort of commercialised in, in, in that aspect. So yeah, hearing this tune like uh, at numerous parties was just something really spooky and I hadn't heard anything like it before. It was just, um, you know, if you sort of put it in the context of the time, which was like 92 or 93, um, maybe even earlier, I don't remember. But um, yeah, there was just something really sort of menacing and futuristic and really exciting about this tune. It's a really simple tune, but just like, you know, dark, murky British dance music from the early 90s which was something that really you know from there I kind of explored and found all kinds of stuff but this is probably the tune that switched me on to the electronic music in the first place That was a meat beat manifesto, and um, 
Yeah, your fourth choice is obviously a very, very long way from that. It was it's by um, Frankel Tortoise. This song called Glass Museum. But yeah, what what is it about it that does it for you? But again, I think people like Tortoise and Fridge. It was sort of this is what you can do if you sort of take away structures and if you take away vocals, if you take away any sort of you know natural performance that you can just like kind of drone out for for five minutes without really doing anything and just keep it just as intense as as if you had sort of, you know, rigid structures. Um, so that record kind of really sort of changed my mind in terms of how how music can be recorded and how it can be sort of performed. And yeah, that was a sound that just really, really sort of got me excited um, in terms of like what you can do with, with with just really minimal setups and just really clever ideas. So that record was, was great for me. a taste of that song Glass Museum by Tortoise and finally it's uh, Wichita Lineman by Glen Campbell which is a classic record but uh, still surprising to be on your five what was it about that one in particular that grabs you? Well, the thing about this tune I think if you remove it from, from what it is which is like a very well known classic pop tune by Glen Campbell and his big like silky quiff it's actually a really beautiful beautiful song um, and it's so like lyrically it's so ambiguous um, but musically as well the arrangements on it are just super like the drums just sound amazing and the um, like the instrumental breaks on it it's actually like the last 30 seconds of the tune where it kind of goes into the instrumental break and someone has like, had the audacity to pull the fader down at that point so I'd love to like find the tapes where it's just kind of the, the orchestra just kind of plays out for another minute because that's, I think that's possibly like the best 30 seconds instrumental break you know you'll ever find I am a lineman for the county and I drive the main road searching in the sun for another overload I hear you singing in the wire Through the wine and the witch a tall lineman is still on the line. I know I need a small vacation. But it don't look like rain And if it snows that stretch down south Won't ever stand the strain And I need you more than won't you And I want you for all time And the Wichita lineman is still on the line. That was Wichita Lineman with Glenn Campbell to finish off the 
five tracks that we've had picked by Bonobo for uh, today's podcast. And thank you once again to the very, very special guest, Simon Green, for dropping by and having a chat about the brilliant new album, Black Sands, that's out on the 29th of March via Ninja Tune Records. That said, it's not the only thing coming out on Ninja Tune this month, and it's not the only good thing. I'm now going to play you a selection of some of the best of the rest. I'm going to kick off by playing Amika's single, Double Edge. That was a section of Double Edge by Emiko. Next up, it's by Infesticons, and it's the Kick Anthem, and it's out now on Big Dada Records. Check this out. was Kick Anthem by Infesticons. It's out now on Big Dada. Be sure to come and pick that one up. Next up is Jammer with the single Better Than, which is out now on Big Dada. Better than what? Better than who? Better than me? I'm better than you. Better than what? Better than who? Better than me? I'm better than you. Better than what? Better than who? Better than me? I'm better than you. Better than what? Better than who? Better than me? I'm better than you. Better than who? Better than me? Ain't better than Dizzy? Ain't better than D? Get that Shop that start that better than for say better than me. I beat the two. Better than man ain't better than who. Better than jam. Better than skeppy. Boy, but I know I'm always ready. Stay silent, you ain't better than Teddy. Better than what? Better than who? Better than who? Better than them. Man's moving like they're bigger than Ben. None of these youths ain't big like H. I'm a big dog, you're a little MC. I'm an ammo, you're just as head free. Better than who? What? Better than me? I'm better than you. I'm a better MC. Better than what? Better than who? Better than me? I'm better than you. Better than what? Better than who? That was Jammer's Better Than, which is out now on Big Dada. And coming up next, we've got a track by Andrea Triana called Lost Where I Belong. Obviously, this one was produced by Simon, who was our guest this week. We had a little bit of a chat about that. So yeah, check this one. It's Lost Where I Belong by Andrea Triana, and it's the Flying Lotus remix. It's out in April.
that was the Flying Lotus remix of Lost Where I Belong by Andrea Triana, which is out in April by Ninja Tune Records. And next up, I've got Brighton's Grass Cut with a track called Muppet, which is out now. And I'm sure you'll agree that this is a great one. Have a little listen to this. That was a section of Grass Cut's Muppet, which is out now via Ninja Tune. And finally, last but certainly not least, I've got a track called Stampede Me by Daedalus. This one's coming out on the Brain Feeder label on the 22nd of March. My rising voice invokes the dust As arrows fly All stand by Impenetrable Unseizable, the sudden of sight will escape, will escape, unscape to the moon. That was Stampede Me by Days Buds, taken from their mini album, which is coming out on Brain Feeder on the 22nd of March. Obviously, it's a Ninja Tune artist, but they're doing a mini album for the Brain Feeder label, and that was Stampede Me. All that remains for me now, then, is to say thank you once again to Simon for coming and having a chat, everyone at Ninja, you guys for listening, Darren Knott for producing. I've been Dexter. Thanks so much for listening, and tune in again.